Hello, value community. Thank you for joining our second gathering of Real Talk, Real Change for the 2021-2022 academic year. It's really great to be here with you all. And I've, I've got to admit, the snow this morning, the one with the flakes the size of small rats, it was playing with my emotions a bit, as it always does in this nominal spring. But being here with you, all is giving me a bit of a boost, and I think today's going to be pretty dynamic. So before we start in earnest, we want to take a few moments for a land acknowledgement. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called De Jo since time immemorial. And in 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly, but unsuccessfully, sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the whole chunk nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. As I've communicated before, we recognize that this land acknowledgement is just the beginning. We recognize that we need to commit to deeper learning and to find ways to do something more substantive. And we at OEDI are currently examining our role in helping promote indigenous education in accord with Act 31, and to interface it with Native nations more generally. We've got more to come, so we'll keep you posted. I would also like to establish a few ground rules to help support keeping a supportive environment of care. And specifically, I wanna to say to maintain a supportive environment, we ask that those taking part in our events be respectful to all and bring an attitude of curiosity and understanding different perspectives and lived experiences. We may remove and or block content that we deem to be abusive or hateful, disrespectful to others based on race, sexual orientation, gender, ethnicity, religion, or political identity. All right, so we've got our rules of engagement. We're ready for a really exciting day. I am Percival Matthews, and I'm associate professor in the Department of Educational Psychology and the interim associate dean for the School of Education's Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, or OEDI for short. Real Talk, Real Change is brought to you by a joint collaboration between OEDI and PLACE, or our, our professional learning and community education at UW-Madison School of Education. Real Talk, Real Change is a symposium series that focuses on critical issues of equity in education, often centering the voices of those from racially, ethnically, and or gender minoritized communities. So Real Talk, Real Change brings together the expertise of faculty, staff, stakeholders from the broader community, to explore critical issues of social justice and education and beyond. And we typically have attendance that numbers in hundreds of folks and oriented towards action, accountability, and inclusion. Today, we're gonna to focus on issues concerning trans care in Wisconsin, including discussing some of the particular difficulties faced by trans people of color and the rapidly evolving challenges to trans care presented on multiple societal fronts. As rapidly as some ideas about gender have shifted in our, in our society, many beliefs and attitudes are very deeply entrenched and leave this group particularly vulnerable. And I look forward to learning more from our panelists about these issues and how we can be better advocates today. Now, I'd like to take a moment to introduce the other moment, members of our coordinating committee. Oops, I forgot the housekeeping issue. <laughs> When you have questions in the chat, please submit them to Lisa Barker, and you may update your names and pronouns if desired using the rename tool and Zoom. And when things are done, please complete the survey that we're going to share toward the end of the event, and because we'd love to hear from you and appreciate your input and feedback. Is that better? So as we introduce the other members of the coordinating committee, again, I'm Percival Matthews. And if we move towards the center here, we've got Dr. Urel Lashley. He's a director of programs at PLACE. He's also the director of student empowerment for um, the Center of the Arts, Education and Social Emotional Learning. Dr. Lashley is a developmental psychologist interested in self-efficacy and social emotional learning in arts, academics, and integrated environments. He's also an accomplished drummer and founder of and the founder and director of Drum Power, which focuses on social emotional learning through music. And then we have Dr. Lisa Barker. Dr. Barker is the executive director of PLACE, and she's also affiliate faculty in UW-Madison's Department of Curriculum and Instruction. She earned her doctorate in curriculum and teacher and education from Stanford University, and is interested in how the principles and practices of improvisational theater 
can inform the work of educators. You'll note that she has, she's very theatrical, especially when people who study gesture really like these things. Uh, Dr. Barker taught English education at several universities, including City University of New York, where she helped launch the first MA in applied theater in the United States. Dr. Barker began her career as a high school English reading and drama teacher. And now that you know all about her, Dr. Barker is going to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Percival. Um, on the next slide, you will see an agenda for how we plan on spending our time together. Um, Percival just did activity number one, which is a, a welcome, and I'm doing number two. After I tell you a little bit about our panelists and anchoring questions for tonight, um, we'll have an open opportunity for panelists to respond to those central questions and then a um, substantial amount of time for q and I'm actually the person in a moment who will be back channeling and receiving all of your questions or resources or shout outs that you might add to the chat. You can feel free to send those to me and then I'll share those with our colleagues supporting the event tonight to curate those questions for y'all. We'll also have space on activity five for panelists to offer closing thoughts. We have this question that we always use about an insight that the panelists gathered from any other person on the panel that they sort of take with them into their lives from today. Then we'll hear some closing thoughts from our colleague Yurel, um, and we'll also allot some time for y'all to complete that survey for us. On the next slide are the central questions. There are three main ones, main pastures that we'll move in and out of. One is just having a definition of trans care. What do we mean by that? Number two, what difficulties do trans people and particularly trans people of color face in accessing kinds of care? And also what resources are available um, for care and access? Number three is really important and that's the roles that we can all play and the various roles that we have in our lives to improve access for care for trans individuals. Um, so the vast majority of what we discussed tonight will dance in and around these past years. I have the honor of actually um, sharing the bios of our esteemed panelists with y'all. So um, on the next slide, you'll see a picture of those good folks and I will uh, share their bios with you. First up is Stephanie Budge. Stephanie is, excuse me, is an associate professor in the Department of Counseling Psychology and the director of the Advancing Health Equity and Diversity Program in the Collaborative Center for Health Equity at UW-Madison. She founded the Trans Care Collaborative, which is a group of scholars and community advocates who work together to improve research focused on care for two-spirit, transgender, and non-binary people. She provides clinical trainings nationally and internationally related to LGBTQ issues, focusing on practitioners' self-efficacy, knowledge, awareness, and skills. Next, we have Sergio Dominguez, Jr. Sergio is a doctoral student in the Department of Counseling Psychology at UW-Madison. Broadly, they are interested and invested in trans well-being, ethical and legal professional issues in psychology, and relationship-centered research and clinical approaches. Working with the Trans Care Collaborative, Sergio was responsible for creating a training protocol for therapists that focuses on how to incorporate radical healing into therapy with trans people of color. Our third and final panelist is Molly McQuillan. Molly is an assistant professor in educational leadership and policy analysis at UW-Madison. She uses a mixed methods approach to examine the intersection of educational policy, social relationships, and health of LGBTQ plus students and educators. Dr. McQuillan's research describes local school districts policy and procedural responses to state legislative, legislative mandates, the experiences of transgender school workers, gender inclusive educational leadership practices, and the physical health consequences of poor school climates. So with that, I will hand it back to my colleague, Percival, to orchestrate tonight's conversation. Thank you for introducing our panelists. And as we begin, um, Lisa introduced the questions. I believe that Dr. Budge is going to start off with a little bit in the way of vocabulary to help orient people in a few key concepts as we, and then we'll launch into some of the questions about what is trans care, about the difficulties that people face 
um, face and then some of the roles that we can play in being advocates and improving access to care. Dr. Budge. All right, thank you so much. I'm really excited to hear people's questions and to be on a panel um, with my esteemed colleagues. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to define uh, a few terms for everybody, um, but just maybe noting that some of these definitions and terms can be variable and fluid. And also we um, as a panel would love to answer questions around terminology. We typically get questions about terminology um, when we do presentations about this work. I also, before I define things, a few things that weren't included in my um, bio, I'm a queer white cisgender woman. And I think that's really important as we start to center trans people in this conversation and also trans people of color. And so um, I, it, it'll be important to talk about, you know, being a provider and, and what that means and being an advocate and what that means and how those identities interact and relate um, to what we're talking about. So um, the first thing that we wanted to talk about is gender. So what is gender? Um, and gender encompasses a few different concepts, including identity, expression, and gender roles. And these are all different parts of a system of meanings and symbols and rules that we have that are all culturally defined. And so you won't find the same kinds of rules or systems of meaning in every single culture. And there are going to be different definitions of, of what it means to be somebody who's a man, a woman, neither a man or a woman, um, or someone who uh, lives along and experiences the gender spectrum. Um, so the other thing that we wanted to note is that everybody has a gender identity um, and or has an identity that includes um, an agender identity. So everyone has a relationship to gender in some way um, and that this encompasses one's own behaviors or their own self-awareness um, around a gender continuum. Um, there are a couple of other terms that you hear us talking about today. So we'll probably be using the word trans or transgender interchangeably, and that encompasses identities where somebody's current gender is different from the gender that they were assigned when they were born. Uh, we'll also be using the term non-binary, um, and this is an umbrella term that typically encompasses identities that aren't exclusively masculine or feminine, um, and that you can kind of fall outside of what we call like these binary gender categories, usually man or woman, um, that are typical categories of, of Western societies. Um, and uh, if people have more questions about that, we're happy to share. Uh, we're also gonna be talking about two-spirit people. Um, and this is a term that some indigenous people use to describe their sexual gender and or spiritual identity. Um, this is also an umbrella term that can encompass a wide variety of genders. Um, and it often and can include um, people who might be described in Western cultures as trans or transgender and or non-binary. Um, you heard me use the word cis or cisgender earlier. So this is a term that refers to a person or people whose gender is um, the same as the gender they were assigned when they were born. We're gonna be talking about the concept of cis normativity um, in this panel in some way, shape or form and really it's gonna encompass everything we talk about. And this is a set of cultural practices that assume that cisgender people or identities are normal or standard. Um, and that implies that by default that trans people or trans identities are, are abnormal. We'll also be talking about transphobia. Um, which includes the, the fear, hatred, um, disbelief, or mistrust of people who are trans um, or thought to be trans. Um, and uh, I think that those are the majority of the terms that we'll probably be talking about, but I won't go into it in more detail. Um, if people have more questions, please ask. Um, so the question at hand is, what is trans care? Um, and my colleagues have a lot to say about this, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, but Trans care and how we're going to be talking about it today includes any kind of service that involves physical or mental health care or where caretaking is involved in some way, shape or form. And we're talking about it today because historically trans people have been discriminated against within medical and mental health care systems, um, usually by the providers themselves um, and often by the policies that do not include equal or equitable care. Um, I'm most familiar with trans care as it relates to mental health care and the types of experiences that trans, two-spirit, non-binary people have within that system, mainly because I'm a psychologist, I train people who are becoming therapists, and I also, my primary caseload um, in the whole time that I've been a provider uh, includes trans, non-binary, and two-spirit people. Um, so that's really where my 
um, experiences are going to come from. Um, and probably too, like Sergio and I will be talking about some of the work that we do in the Trans Care Collaborative. Um, and so I'll provide a little bit of context for that. Um, the care in this, um, uh, in, in what trans care means, it indicates counseling, advocacy, research, and education. Um, and just so people have some context for the work that we do within mental health care um, and with, within medical care too, we're a group of social justice driven um, community members and academics. Um, and our goal is to figure out ways to, um, to, to improve access to mental health care and to medical care and within systems that often are uh, oppressive and discriminatory um, for trans people. So I think um, I'll end there because I've been talking for a little bit, um, but I know that we can all kind of add on to each other too um, once we've uh, started chatting, so. Thank you, Dr. Butch. So she started talking about what trans care means to her. I think that both Dr. McQuillan and Sergio, we wanted to hear a little bit about your perspective on you know, what is trans care, what's it mean to you? Um, Sergio? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, before I answer that question though, I do want to add some additional things that weren't mentioned um, in my bio as well. Um, for me, it feels really important to mention that I am a queer, trans, slash non-binary, slash very gender ambiguous uh, person. Um, I am a first-generation student. I am a first-generation documented American. I um, I'm a doctoral student, um, which I believe was already um, mentioned. Um, I am able-bodied and I live with some invisible disabilities um, and I benefit from middle-class privilege at the moment. Um, and all these things will come together um, and certainly inform the things that I notice and speak about, um, as well as the things that I will inevitably like omit and frankly kind of up throughout our conversation today. Um, I am also from the south side of Chicago. Um, that's really important to me. And I was raised in Mexico, and that's really important to me as well. Um, and I like to think that I take a very um, counter hegemonic approach to academia, where I like to filter myself as little as possible. And so you will notice that I will say, and fucking throughout our conversation today. Um, and if there is any feedback that folks would like to provide around that, please feel free to do so. Um, this is how I um, am choosing to show up authentically in this space. Um, I think that it also feels important to uh, name that I am standing on Ho-Chunk land. And I think in addition to the land acknowledgement that was provided earlier, I do want to invite folks um, who are located on occupied land um, to connect with local indigenous communities to um, see the ways that we can um, individually and collectively use our privileges uh, to make sure that we are repatriating and paying reparations to folks um, who are um, historically and contemporarily stewards of this land. Um, and I think particularly for folks in Madison, I do wanna um, throw a quick plug out there for um, a healing collective called GIGA, that's G-I-I-G-E. They are a um, queer trans indigenous uh, healing collective here locally in Madison that does a lot of activist work. Um, and so for folks that have um, real adult jobs where you are paid more than a graduate student budget or you hold um, additional privileges, I do want to invite you all to just like throw your money at that organization um, or to like support them in whatever way it feels most congruent with whatever their specific needs might be as you connect with them. Trans care. So I just want to go ahead and like retweet all of everything that Stephanie said um, as it relates to trans care. I think that I generally really vibe um, with that definition that feels very encompassing. And I do want to add a couple of things to that um, because I think so often when we think of trans care, we tend to focus a lot on gender, right? And on this like broad social construct of gender, um, which I think um, here in the US in our current um, time and place uh, very much depends on whiteness as a prototype for gender. And when I think of whiteness, I don't just think of like, 
you know, skin tone or like racial identity, but I think of like whiteness in terms of proximity to what it means to like be a white man and a white woman, which makes it so that it encompasses not just race, but also social status and ability and body shape and size. It encompasses uh, nationality, um, cognitive and emotional capacity, right? It encompasses all these different things um, that then become prototypes for what we mean in terms of gender. Now, when we think of trans care and we think of gender in relation to trans care, um, and if we frame it only from the perspective of um, gender, then we can inadvertently start to miss all these other dimensions that nonetheless impact trans people and particularly multiply marginalized trans people. And so some additional things that I want to throw out there that fall under the uh, idea of trans care are like sex work and sex work decriminalization, immigration and asylum seeking processes, um, the substance use and like substance use decriminalization and substance use and criminalization systems, um, housing, housing and access to housing, um, employment and education, adoption and family structures. Um, and I think the last thing, and I think for me, something that um, feels um, increasingly important is uh, access to and retention of disability related resources and benefits. Um, and these are all things that impact trans people that I think so often don't get talked about because we think of these prototypes of what it means to be trans that depend on whiteness. And so as we have these conversations today about trans care, I want to very um, warmly and enthusiastically invite people to think about the ways um, that trans care means more than just looking at gender. Thank you for that. Um, it's, it's interesting the way that you speak highlights what it means to have intersectional identities, but in a way that is really sort of more expansive. Is there are all these different dimensions, and so you can think about all the other possible points of intersection. So um, with that, we should ask Dr. McQuillan, what do you have to add when you think about what trans care means to you? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, those were two great and different approaches, I think, to thinking about um, care and in the work that I do, um, thinking about educational policies and human development, um, I think about care and the lack of care across multiple different systems. And so thinking about individual development nested within um, close social relationships, so family and peer relationships, kind of nested within a broader school community. Um, most of my work is focused on youth, but I've started to think more about um, workplace climate and, and schools as, as workplaces. Um, and then thinking about those school systems nested within a broader state regional um, policy context nested within the larger US legal and educational system. And so when we think about that model um, and bringing that into the Wisconsin context, one of the first things that um, I think about is kind of the lack of structural care um, related to gender, um, which interlocks with some of those other systems of oppression as well. Um, and, and the fact that Wisconsin lacks a lot of legislative protections for trans people. When we think about um, the Wisconsin discrimination laws, bullying laws, hate crime legislation. Um, and Wisconsin is also within that broader US system um, where there are clear protections for trans people in the workplace. Uh, in the, the federal circuit court, there's clear protections for trans uh, students. Um, but that misalignment between the federal, state, and local education system can create um, some disparities in the kinds of care in terms of the structural and social support that kid or, kids are getting across schools. Um, and a lot of that misalignment has some real health consequences. And so when we think about this current political climate where there are hundreds of anti-LGBTQ bills, um, 18 that have passed in the last year, two thirds of those bills were targeting trans people. 
and many of them are targeting trans youth. And so thinking about care in this kind of legal context um, and how trans kids have really been weaponized for political gain, even though that's counter to the evidence from the research community. Um, so many of the policies and laws that are being proposed nationally and locally are, um, like I said, really counter to the prevailing academic wisdom um, and statements by pretty much all of the largest medical organizations, including the American Medical Association. Um, in a, a recent study, uh, a survey study conducted by the Trevor Project, about 95% of queer and trans youth have reported that this political environment has negatively impacted their mental health. Um, a study that I did here in Madison uh, has shown that there are some real structural and social disparities for trans and queer youth here. Um, for instance, you know, twice as many trans kids report being anxious, two and a half times as many trans kids in Madison Public Schools report being depressed, four times more trans students in Madison uh, have seriously considered or have attempted suicide. Um, in another study that I've done with gender diverse kids, um, looking at uh, biomarkers of stress, um, I found that greater social stressors and less social support that is specifically related to gender identity can um, have a physiological effect. And so um, kiddos who had less social support uh, and greater uh, experiences of discrimination and social stress had greater levels of inflammation. And so when we think again, you know, about care or lack of care um, and thinking about how that might influence the academic uh, and, and physical health of kids, um, you know, that's kind of how I'm thinking about the work as well and how it might fall across multiple different systems. Um, and the converse of that is, of course, some policy protections, things like inclusive professional development for educators and um, medical providers, all of these things, um, uh, you know, things like using uh, kids' names and pronouns appropriately, all of these things do have sufficient evidence to show that these are healthy practices for young people and their development. And then the last point that I want to make is that a lot of the care in terms of policy or social supports really that, that's aimed at um, creating more affirming environments for trans people are really arguably better for, for everyone when we think about um, human development. And so many of the kind of rigid gender beliefs that negatively impact trans people and you know, I think about how this, this plays out in schools, but um, many of those beliefs and how they get institutionalized in policies and practices also negatively impact cisgender, um, cis identified people as well. And they prevent all people really from acting um, and identifying in ways that feel authentic. Thank you. You know, you, you all have um, given us some interesting frameworks when we ask what is trans care, that, to think about it from a systemic level, societal structures, social structures, legal structures. And um, Molly started to talk a lot more about very specific things that transition well to our next question, which is, can you talk to us about some of the difficulties specifically that trans people, particularly trans people of color, face in trying to access, access care and about some of the resources that might be available? Sure. So I can speak to that. I mean, I think that um, when I was thinking about preparing what would be important and, and impactful um, in this conversation, I, you know, got some of the stats that we use in our publications and, and thought about, well, will that have an impact in me talking about it? I think I can provide some resources to people if you want to read the reports and read about the statistics. But I do think that um, beyond just the, the statistics of what the disparities are, I think it's important to talk about um, 
you know, why the reasons these disparities exist. Um, and then also, you know, why the different systems of oppression that interact with each other are kind of impacting specifically trans people of color. Um, if people are interested in reading about the stats, the United States, um, the US Trans Survey, you can just look up USTS 2015. Um, and there are reports that specifically break out um, groups of people of color. If you want to you know, read those reports, that's a great resource for people if you're looking for actual information um, where you can find um, you know, stats around the disparities. So I can put that um, in the chat with um, that Amanda can share um, if that's something. So there's the full report that Lisa just shared, but also um, there are specific reports um, that are breaking down. But I, I think you know, because I, I think you're not here to necessarily hear us just spout off statistics. Um, we really want like to put humanity and and narratives and stories into what is actually happening. Um, and um, one of the examples that that I thought I would provide is that um, in the Trans Care Collaborative, we've been spending a lot of time talking about um, how whiteness infiltrates um, all types of different kind of medical and mental health care and specifically how everybody, you know, how people are trained, how all the policies exist and, and what does that mean um, for the work that we're doing in terms of um, trying to improve and increase access to specifically mental health care because that's a lot of the work that we do. Um, and so when we were talking as a group, um, you know, what is preventing trans people of color um, from going in and seeking mental health care? So there are a couple of things. Um, the first thing that we know from the literature is that um, most, most therapists aren't trained um, in any of the things that we're talking about today, right? So they, uh, in training programs, um, there really is a lack of attention um, to what gender means, what it is. Um, and also there's this idea that you have to be a specialist to be able to work with trans people at all, which is a, a complete misconception, right? Like we all have gender identities. Um, and, and as the other panelists have talked about, this is just something that should be a base level of information um, that the people have um, and embody and, and learn about. Um, and so, you know, part of, so what we were trying to figure out is one of the barriers is just, you know, therapists in general um, not being trained. Um, and so trans people generally, and specifically trans people of color experiencing both transphobia and then racism at the same time. Um, from their providers. Um, so that's one, one barrier that we, we thought about. But another barrier is that there's also something to be said about having a shared experience with a provider that can be really powerful. So, um, you know, not every provider is going to identify as trans. And what we've heard from um, research participants and um, from people in community is um, it would be really nice to connect with providers who share some similar identities. Um, and have some shared experiences. And so um, even saying that, so some of the barriers are just like a lack of overlap, a lack of training, and also just a lack of shared experience that makes people feel comfortable um, engaging in medical and mental health care. Um, so one of the things that we decided to do as a group was, well, let's see um, what kinds of um, things we can figure out for people coming to therapy does seeing a trans therapist of color um, actually um, impact um, people accessing their care. So that's one thing that we thought about. Um, I think Sergio is heavily involved in this. And so I think, I don't know, Sergio, you don't need to talk about this obviously, but uh, it, it might be a nice transition into some of the work that Sergio is doing the most amazing work on this project. So um, probably better to hear from them than from me. But that's kind of an intro into some of the work um, that we've thought about and how we're starting to think about accessing care. Thank you, Sergio. <laughs> Stephanie, um, thank you so much for the shout out. Um, actually, as you were speaking, one of the things that I was like trying to think about is like, hmm, how do I want to approach this particular question? Because um, I think while while I was, um, I think initially like prepared to to speak to some of the work that that we're doing in this clinical trial, um, I feel like the universe is like tugging me in a slightly different direction. So um, I think that. You know, first to maybe speak a little bit about some of the work that we are doing within um, 
within within our research. Um, you know, I think here what I'm thinking lots about is um, about radical healing and about like f the five tenets of radical healing, um, which are collectivism, critical consciousness, radical hope, strength and resistance, and cultural authenticity and self knowledge. And the reason that I mention these, these things is because um, when I think of the barriers um, that trans people of color in particular face when accessing care, I think about the ways that um, access to care inhibits being able to access a sense of collectivism or inhibits um, the capacity to um, engage um, in cultural authenticity and self-knowledge, right? There are these systems that are built um, so that we despite like these things being good for us, despite these things being instrumental to what healing can look like, these systems inhibit our capacity and our ability to be able to access these things that ultimately um, make it challenging for us to access pleasure. And so I think here is where I'm feeling maybe a little bit more drawn and where I'm feeling the universe kind of tugging me in the direction of like, particularly speaking to like the trans people on the call, because I mean, I, um, would be like 99% sure that there are like trans people um, here. And so I feel like I'm uniquely positioned to be able to speak to, to that and to speak to the trans folks that um, are watching live or will be watching later, um, which is that uh, our pleasure is so important. Um, and when I think about um, the difficulties um, that trans people of color face, um, I think of, accessing pleasure. And I think of the ways that um, we can cultivate pleasure and how like the ability to cultivate pleasure individually and collectively um, and through like reconnecting with our roots can be like such a powerful thing that is so, um, that will shift systems, right? Um, and I think, you know, to that end, you know, I also want to invite the cis and straight people who are um, here and who will watch um, like later to connect with trans people of color um, and to listen and to help bolster our capacity for experiencing pleasure. Um, and the way that I'm thinking of pleasure, I mean, like, I, I think of it very expansively. I think of it um, in terms of, like, access to, like, basic necessities, right? I mean, that's, like, a lot of trans people of color, um, you know, because of these systems that we live in, maybe don't have access to basic necessities that ultimately make it so that we can then access pleasure and focus on pleasure, right? Like it's hard to focus on pleasure whenever we don't know where the next meal is gonna come from or whenever we don't know um, if there's gonna be a roof over our heads or whenever we don't know if like, we might potentially like lose our child um, within like the foster system or while engaging in like with CPS or maybe like losing a child by interacting with like transphobic medical systems, right? Um, you know, I think, I think about all these different things and I think about how, um, like cis and straight people are very uniquely positioned to be able to make change within these systems so that we can have access to these basic like human fundamental needs so that we can access pleasure because otherwise without it we just it's it's hard to focus on like self-care and this thing that we call self-care and that we're touting around a lot right now that it's like super in whenever like we don't even have time to think about self-care whenever maybe we don't have time to like do like high yoga or whatever if we're like worried about something else or if we don't have the money to be able to afford basic necessities right um so i'm thinking yeah i'm, th I'm thinking lots about that as we're thinking about this but then i'm also thinking about um access to uh access to the microphone and about like visibility and about who gets to be on panels such as this um the three of us who are um on this panel um I mean, I'm a person of color and also my 
sister never stops making fun of me for the fact that like living in Wisconsin makes it so that like winter like during the winter I just kind of look like Wonder Bread and so for like all intents and purposes like you know this is basically an all-white panel right and um and I am the one trans person on this panel um which is a problem right like there is systematic exclusion of who gets to have a voice in these spaces and I know for a fact that there are other trans people of color in Madison and particularly like Black Black trans folks, Black trans femmes, um, who could have also been on this panel, but um, were not selected to be on this panel, or maybe like folks weren't connected um, to communities, um, to local communities, um, trans communities of color. Uh, so again, I, I feel like I'm very much on the connect to community train today, where like I think the single most powerful thing that we can do, and perhaps resources, um, that we can think of, right, to veer it back to the, the question that was asked, um, if we're trying to learn more about particular difficulties, connect to communities, listen, establish fruitful, meaningful relationships, and then use privilege to change things for us so that we can have um, beautifully exquisite, delicious, pleasurable lives. Well said, and you've already transitioned in a real way to these questions about what role we can all play in improving access to care for trans individuals. And thank you for that. And we wanted to go ahead and ask um, Dr. Budge and Dr. McQuillan, if you had a, a few more things to say about the roles that all the rest of us can play in improving this access to care and the way that Sergio started us off. Um, well, I think, you know, again, one of the things I think a lot about uh, is the law and policies and um, and this kind of connects to the last question as as well, but uh, many of the bills that are anti trans are also tied to um, other kinds of systems of oppression and so. Um, you know sometimes when we're thinking about how these bills get implemented. Um, or how people understand protective policies, um, that understanding is rooted in whiteness. And many of these anti-trans legislation uh, bills, they are connected to white supremacy, you know, restricting educators from talking about race and other kinds of marginalization in schools. Um, and so these systems of oppression are really deeply intertwined as Sergio made in his first point of the evening. Um, and so advocating, I think, you know, in, in terms of fighting back against some of these, the, the legislation, and I'll provide some additional resources of ways that people can do that, um, but also in, in local ways. So encouraging conversations about gender in your kids' classroom or with your family. So there's a lot of, um, so there are, there's a lot of different, you know, larger ways that you can be involved um, in terms of supporting um, advocacy, in terms of supporting um, trans-led advocacy organizations with your time and, and your financial resources and um, a lot of local smaller ways where you can make a difference as well. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, I don't have a lot more to add. I think that really um, Sergio said it all when they said, um, that just listen to trans people. I feel like that's the thesis of what we need to be talking about here. Um, and so if, if we say, what role can we all play in improving access to care for trans people? Listen to trans people. Um, because I think that really what's been happening is that it's cis people who are guiding the conversation. It's cis people who created all the policies. It's cis people, cis white people specifically, who are the people who are, um, you know, champions um, most of the anti-trans bills and a lot of the legislation and policies that seem to be um, the most oppressive. So um, most of us listen to community. Um, that's probably the biggest thing that can happen. I also think, you know, um, you know, when Sergio is also mentioning, you know, 
paying, paying trans people and specifically trans people of color to come onto panels and to give them voice um, in, in very um, public ways so that their voices can be heard more, is, you know, definitely a way to do it. Um, uh, I think part of it is like also making sure that there's not tokenizing at the same time, which can be an interesting balance of, of figuring that out. Um, but I also think that there's this piece um, that, um, that both um, Dr. McQuillan and that and that I have, which is like, how do we use our cis voices um, to be able to, um, you know, be as loud as we can? Because there's also this component of trans people being targeted when they're really loud. So um, when you ask, like, what can we do? Part of it is like, well, I think one of my roles as somebody who um, like founded the Trans Care Collaborative is, you know, bringing in as many people as possible who want to, you know, from from as many countries as possible. We're, a huge, we're an international group of people um, where we say like brainstorm together collectively as a group and listen to each other. Um, and then because I have a PhD and because I'm cis and because I'm white, like these things all provide me a platform to be able to be as loud as I can. So I think part of this is um, being as loud as you can using um, all of the evidentiary basis that we have to be able to dispel the myths that are out there um, and, and listening and paying people for their time. Thank you all for a stimulating discussion so far. Um, I think it's a good time for us to transition to Q&A with the rest of our community. Um, before we start off with any questions, I would like to relay something that someone wrote uh, to Sergio. Sergio, please relay to them that they are truly the best speaker I've ever heard. So I want to make sure you got that one. And um, in line with the last comment, Molly had mentioned that many legislative moves may be counter to evidence in the research community and offer some findings from our research schools. So the questioner asked, could you provide us with an overview of some other insights that we know from research that are relevant to tonight's symposium on trans care? And that's just for everybody. Can you repeat the question, please? I think I spoke quickly. The questioner said, Earlier, Molly had mentioned that many legislative moves may be counter to evidence in the research community. And so what the questioner wants is for you all to offer some more findings from the research and overview of other insights that we know from research that are really relevant to tonight's symposium. I can go ahead and... Oh. Okay, um, so yeah, I, I think it's really funny um, that this question is being posed um, because actually uh, in the chat, um, I just shared um, a resource that I believe Amanda then shared with a larger, broader group. Um, it is a website um, that I recently updated um, in a consultation gig that I did with the American Psychological Association um, that where essentially what we did with the website is that we took um, like mainstream like legislative things that are happening um, that um, are happening as it relates to um, like queer and trans people across the country um, and on an individual like state or like local level. And we came up with these um, different topics I and mean, the framework was already there um, and uh, we basically decided to like write a little bit of context about um, these specific topics as well as specific speaking points that people can use um, as advocates, right? I think that for um, academics in particular, for psychologists, folks um, within psychological practice, and we are like positioned to be able to um, do a lot of advocacy with um, local policy and lawmakers. And so um, really what we wanted to do is we wanted to build a toolkit for folks um, that was evidence-based and that folks could use when engaging in advocacy um, on like a local or like state level or even like a national level for folks that are plugged into that kind of work. Um, and so I think one of the things that I personally feel really proud of um, in having engaged in this work is that um, I made some um, substantial 
edits to the section, particularly around trans exclusion and sports um, by particularly updating the background section and providing context around the fact that what we are seeing legislatively right now um, in terms of um, like anti-trans um, athletic sports efforts um, is sure rooted in transphobia and it's also rooted in anti-blackness in that um, these issues actually emerged around high profile cases that involved two black trans high school girls competing in track teams in the state of Connecticut um, and so really um, what it comes down to um, is that it's not just like okay well trans trans folks and particularly like um, like trans girls and trans women shouldn't be participating in sports but particularly this is around the policing of um, Black trans feminine bodies um, and the way that that looks like in sports. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that that conversation is often absent. Um, and yeah, I think that it is very important to be thinking about um, these issues um, intersectionally, for lack of a better word or lack of a better concept, because um, if we think about these particular um, issues from an intersectional lens, then we begin to notice that um, like anti-trans sports legislation isn't just about targeting trans folks, but rather it will disproportionately necessarily target target trans folks of color and other multiply marginalized trans folks. Um, and so I share all of this to provide some context around some of these conversations, but then also um, to very shamelessly plug like, hey, we have some discussion points on the website um, that folks can use whenever you are calling your lawmakers or writing letters or providing um, testimony or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it is literally there. All you got to do is sum up the motivation and carve out like five minutes to be able to do this stuff because it is there. We appreciate the shameless plug. So there's another question, you know, when we've talked about some of the negative effects so far, we've heard, we've heard you guys mention anxiety, you all mentioned depression, suicide, these sorts of things that are internalizing and one of the questions points to something that's more external that is visited upon. So this person says, I work at a domestic violence agency that is trying to get programs, help and community for transgender individuals and transgender individuals of color. I'm going to paraphrase parts of it, but it'll be direct. We as an organization feel we need to act to stop the death and violence to the trans community by prevention. And what suggestions, resources, or materials would you recommend for these domestic violence agencies trying to stop the violence for trans community members of color and other trans community members? Well, one thing you can do is, um, uh, Dr. Budge, and I believe Sergio might also be involved in um, inclusivity training. And so, you know, in order to just have a foundation for the conversation that might allow you to be more adaptable, right? Because sometimes people want a list of best practices. Um, which might create a foundation, but any leader, whether it's it's in a domestic violence agency or another social service agency needs to have kind of a solid foundation around gender and white supremacy really to be adaptable to the situation, to the context. And so that's one kind of foundational thing. Um, and, I did try to provide um, a couple of links to additional resources. Um, Stephanie, maybe, I know that you've done some training in this area, maybe you could speak. Yeah, I mean, the hard thing about this is that, you know, you can do trainings with people about, you know, here's who trans people are and here's like where bias comes from. But honestly, I think that a lot of this is like, what is the root cause of the violence, 
right? Like where is this anger and this fear coming from? So I, I think that while we use trainings to improve knowledge, I, I think that that's like a very small component of something that can be helpful. That's something that, you know, that we, that Sergio and I do all the time. Um, I, I, so I don't want to discount the utility of, of attending trainings and kind of unlearning bias, um, but I also think about like who, who's attending those trainings and they, are they actually targeting the people who are causing the violence? And then also thinking about like, you know, what are the kinds of things that we can do as a society to dispel myths around the, the fear or to kind of figure out what kinds of power dynamics and relationships are existing um, to create violence towards trans people and specifically trans people of color. Um, so I, this isn't the answer to it, but I do think that like trainings, it's like maybe it may be an answer around, um, you know, working with folks who are in systems to be able to at least make the experience better for folks who are on domestic violence, you know, such situations and shelters. I think that that is one thing. Um, but really, it's this kind of broader systemic shift um, that we need to have in order to, you know, not use trans people as scapegoats and targets. Um, as, as people who like are dehumanized. And that, that's really where a lot of this, um, where a lot of this, the anger and the fear comes from. So I, I think in, in terms of resources, sure, I think, you know, trainings can be helpful, um, but we do need to have more collective shifts, um, you know, from big policy perspectives and also just in, in general about how we talk about gender, how we think about gender, um, to be able to to kind of change why the why the violence is actually occurring in the first place. So that's my broadest answer. I think if you want to talk about like specific resources, a lot of it is related to like, you know, inclusivity policies and domestic violence shelters. Like we're happy to talk a little bit more about that. Or also I will say too, I you know, for me in particular, if you all have questions about specific, you know, if you want data around something specific, please email me cuz you know, we're not going to be able to answer everybody's questions, but I am happy to respond to emails too and give you resources and um, pass along different research um, articles too. Thank you. I wanted to um, quickly make sure that I gave, I didn't mean to say quickly, I wanted to make sure that I intentionally gave Sergio a, a chance to address this question if they had anything to say. Yes, yes, I do. I was running around here in my office space because I was like, oh, I think I have a couple of resources and ideas around this question, which is um, exciting. And I, it feels good to feel prepared. Um, <laughs> so uh, first I want to um, plug this book. Um, it is called Transgressed and it is by um, Javier Guadalupe Diaz. Um, it is a sociological study on what intimate partner violence looks like in trans communities. Um, I had an opportunity to do a book review for this book um, for Trans Studies Quarterly uh, way back when that I think just recently got published because y'all know that peer review takes forever um, and getting published takes forever. Um, but I think, um, so if y'all want like the super like abridged version um, and don't want to read like the whole book, like y'all could take a peek at the review that I wrote. Um, but I think one of the things um, that I'm like thinking about as I'm marinating with this question is that um, it feels also important to attend to the ways that like intimate partner violence um, is like can show up for trans people in the first place. Um, because I feel like some of those pieces we haven't talked about as much because not a lot is known about that. Like this book is literally like the one study. I mean, maybe there are like two right now, like, cause it's been a second since this book's written like two years. So maybe there's like another study on it but there's like one study on what this looks like and what IP looks like um, in trans communities. And so I think the thing that I want to highlight here is that, um, you know, like abusers um, in maintaining like power over um, trans people that they are abusing, um, like 
the way that it looks like for trans people is that it can um, limit what gender expression um, looks like and what it means to be gender conforming versus gender non-conforming, right? And like when we think about it from like a very endocis normative lens and by endocis normativity, I mean, whenever there's like um, congruence um, between gender assigned at birth and current gender um, that um, isn't, or, and where like um, sex characteristics aren't like altered um, or like, yeah, where, where they're not altered as is um, often the case with like intersex folks and won't get into that because that is like not my area. And, um, you know, endocis normativity makes it so that um, we're talking specifically about um, gender congruence um, based on what was assigned um, and currently, right? So um, abuser attacks um, on trans people generally, um, or one of the ways that they maintain power over is through limiting what gender expression can look like, as well as what um, like transition related care can look like. They can limit access to care. They can limit access to community. Um, they can um, like, Reinfor reinforce and reflect cultural scripts, um, which I think when we think about the lack of like broader protections for trans people, um, you know, this is this feels very cumulative here, right? Where like, um, if we think of the flip side, then trans people will necessarily be less likely to seek out help um, when it comes to intimate partner violence because these interventions are not typically created for us. And because sometimes interacting with like law enforcement, particularly for trans people of color can mean that we get murdered. And so um, oftentimes people will stay in um, abusive relationships or in um, power over dynamics um, because they just see no way out and because they um, because interventions aren't created for trans people or with trans people in mind, right? Um, I feel like so often interventions that address intimate partner violence um, reflect second wave feminism in that they depend on gender and particularly on femininity um, as a way to think about who can and cannot be victims of intimate partner violence, um, which then again, if we think about like trans people in the ways that like trans people might deviate from what we think of as like feminine versus masculine, again, these interventions aren't made for us and people typically don't think to to look for the ways that their interventions might be overlooking us. Um, what else can I say about this? I don't know. I think I'm gonna pause there. Check out this book or check out the review. Um, Y'all have resources, check them out. I, I also just put a couple of, um, I think three different citations in the chat too. And one of them especially is a, as a tool that assesses um, IPV in specifically trans masculine folks. So part of that is, um, you know, maybe looking at some of these pieces too um, that have been published in the last two years. So, so far you all have done a really good job of illustrating a lot of the barriers that people face, the transgender individuals face to mental health, physical health. Now we're talking about violence and, and people having a hard way of escaping it. And one of the questions that, that we often have with RTRC is what is it that, that we can do as a community? And I wanna pose, there are two questions here and I'll, I'll outline both of them, but then we'll just deal with one at a time. And one of them is just, you know, a significant number of our attendees today are parents of cis and transgender children. And we wanna know about the advice that you have for parents for gender trans inclusive approaches to parenting. And after that, you know, this is school of educations, um, professional learning. And so there's a question of what can schools do or what are some examples of things that schools and, and communities linked to schools can do. Um, but it's probably, a um, you can attack these in any order you want. Um, the one that probably butts closest to the way that Sergio was talking was about the parents. You know, what advice do you have for parents for these gender trans inclusive practices, I mean, approaches to parenting? I 
mean, I feel like I could talk about this for hours. Um, there's a lot of books that are getting better and better that are developmentally appropriate, depending upon what age your kiddo is. But, you know, a lot of kids, I, I have six-year-olds and, you know, ages three, five, six, three, four, five, six, um, that's really when kids start doing a lot of social categorization, um, as you know, Dr. Matthews. And so that's really, you know, even board books that are representative can be helpful. Um, and then I also would say, you know, it's important to allow yourself to grow too. When I started reading my kids' books about gender, um, you know, I didn't really have that kind, those kinds of resources. I'm 43 when I was growing up and it led me to my own gender journey. And so um, being open to what that means for your own identity and not being threatened and defensive um, of, of something that feels very personal to you is really important um, in that relationship with your child as well. Um, and then if you do need additional support, um, instead of, you know, your personal issues, thinking about gender or how you were socialized, you know, there are a number of really great parent support groups um, that, that can be helpful in your, your relationship with your kiddo as well. Um, and so those are a couple of things that come to mind. Um, but I also feel like I could talk about this for three days, so... Go ahead, Dr. Butch. Yeah, me too. I, I feel like this is a whole, I would love to have more conversations and it's kind of hard because it's like most of us as a panel, but I really, I think part of this is just so individualized to the family and like what the concerns are. Um, I included um, uh, an amazing resource um, by a colleague um, of ours, Dr. M. Matsuno, um, that is, um, it's an online uh, parent support program. And this is mostly designed for parents who are like, this is brand new to them. They are trying to figure out like, what, what is all of this? And so I think that it's a great resource um, for parents who specifically are, um, haven't been exposed to a lot of trans and um, gender expansive stuff. Um, the interesting thing about this is that I think for the most part, like when we're, when I'm working with families, um, it's not the kid who needs help. It's the parents. And it's like, the kid is like, you just let the kid be who the kid is. And like, you follow the kid, you support the kid, you celebrate this young person for how amazing they are. Um, and it's really the parents who like have all these expectations and, and conceptions about what their kid, how their kid was supposed to be or who's you know, how they're supposed to grow up and how they're supposed to act. So I would say most of my work actually is with the parents and having conversations about expectations and talking through a sense of loss around expectations. And, and a lot of times the kids don't even need to be a part of that. It's like, you know, you just support the kid through their amazing, creative, expansive process. Um, and, and so I'm being pretty general because like different families have different needs and different things that are happening. Is your kid being bullied? That's something that's a little bit different than like, is it an internal thing that you're experiencing as a parent? So I think um, I, I would just say uh, some of this kind of just depends on what it is that you're experiencing as a family. And um, as people mention more stuff, I'm, I have so many things I can provide in the chat. So if things come up, I'm happy just to like, ping them in. Sergio, do you have some perspectives to share on this? Yeah, I think uh, Molly and Stephanie, um, you both touched on um, a little bit of this and I just wanna drive this point home a little bit where like um, parents, you know, they're not gonna get it perfectly. Like, you know, no no human is perfect, right? Like we all, we all make mistakes, we all-
speak of. I mean, like even in this space, like I've been like microaggressed in this like space. And like, I mean, I don't know, we're humans and we don't have to perseverate on those things, right? I think that when we remember that we are humans, um, then, you know, hopefully it becomes a little bit like easier to meet ourselves with like self-compassion. And when we can meet ourselves with self-compassion, then that's truly when change can happen, right? That's whenever, um, you know, we can say like, oh, okay, cool. Maybe I don't have to take time um, and energy to like beat myself up over this like mistake that I made. You know, I can like very quickly address it, very quickly correct it, right? Just like quick, like, oh, thank you for correcting me. Like if we like misgender someone or like, you know, thank you for sharing this about yourself or like, oh, sorry, thanks, um, right? Like just quick, easy, quick and dirty. And then um, instead of like harping on things, we can instead um, take that time and energy to like continue learning or to continue like developing um, deep, meaningful, really beautiful relationships. Again, we're like all human. We're not gonna get it perfectly. No one gets it perfectly. And that is like a-okay. And um, my hope that is that the takeaway will be that like, you know, as parents, I mean, no one no one gives anybody the parenting training manual, um, right? There's like not a manual. So like, yeah, you know, no one's gonna get it perfectly. That's okay. I mean, there are some great resources, and I also want to take responsibility. I misgendered Sergio, and so I appreciate somebody for bringing that to my attention. Um, and but you know, you're right, Sergio, in terms of parenting kids who are trans or non-binary. Um, it is a, a learning journey, and um, having that self-compassion. Um, and also empathy for your kid, right? Because it is, everybody's learning in this process. I feel like parenting is a constant lesson on that. Um, and I saw in the chat that there's a question about what schools can do. And I would also echo what Stephanie said about, you know, a lot of, almost all of the issues that come up around gender in schools really has to do with the adults who are in schools or outside of schools. And that's something that comes up again and again in interviews with educational leaders, with kids, with parents. Um, and a, a lot of times teachers have a lot of anxiety talking about gender or including gender inclusive practices and curriculum. And um, some of that anxiety um, might have a foundation, but oftentimes uh, the kids understand <laughs> uh, gender diversity a little bit better than adults do who have been socialized in a specific way their entire life. And so every time that I've talked to a teacher about a, a lesson plan or new curriculum that they want to embed, the teacher has a lot of anxiety about how it's going to go. And it's continuously telling them, you're thinking about the questions that come up for you or your peer group, but these questions aren't going to come up for the kids. The kids are going to understand it. And inevitably that's exactly what happens. And, um, and um, you know, again, getting back to what Sergio said, as a, as a former teacher, you know, you, you make a hundred mistakes in a day and the classroom. And so um, trying to be empathetic with your students and yourself as you're practicing new skills is really important. So that was a great point, I think, because sometimes people don't do the work because they're afraid they're going to mess up. Go ahead, Sergio. I know that we've been on this question for like a second now. <laughs> I, I have some it was two questions. I'm not supposed to ask two questions. Okay, great. Yeah, so we're we're double barreled here. So it's great. We can ramble a little bit. <laughs> so um so, so there are some additional tangible things that I want to add here. Um, I think something that continues to be in like broader conversations is like access to bathrooms, y'all. Like people gotta pee. Like, and there are reports of like um, children and adolescents in schools like not going to the bathroom the entire day and then waiting until they like get home to be able to like safely, um, I was gonna say safely and comfortably, but really it comes down to safety and less so comfort, like to be able to safely use the bathroom so like gender inclusive bathrooms right it's 
I don't know. I think it's not that hard, but people jump through hoops over this, so whatever. Um, gender inclusive bathrooms, gender inclusive like languaging. Um, like there are, I feel like a zillion forms that like parents and children like have to um, fill out or read or encounter when it comes to schooling, like making sure that those are like gender inclusive um, as well feels really important. Um, whatever like record systems there are to make sure that there are like options for people to be able to um, have whatever like names, pronouns, genders are congruent with what feels good to them. Um, what else? Oh, access to like menstrual products um, in like all bathrooms, period. Um, what else? I don't know. Those are some initial things that I can think of tangibly. I'm sure that other folks have additional ideas too. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of, of other tangible, piece, tangible pieces, I included the welcoming schools um, resource in the chat, um, which is something that MMSD has incorporated, um, but it's, you know, one of the first few school districts in the country that started implementing uh, a lot of these policies. So there are tons of great resources about this, but I also think part of this is thinking about it developmentally, you know, like for kids who are younger, are there teachers who are putting kids in, you know, like line up boys and girls, you know, so part of it is like having conversations from the very beginning about like how how is gender showing up in educational spaces and like what does that look like and a lot of the times it's how teachers were either how they were raised in schools or how they were trained in schools and so a lot of that is having conversations from a systemic level around you know how does gender show up in your classroom it's not even just the gendered spaces like the bathrooms and the locker rooms but it's also you know I, I worked with young people who you know when they have overnight trips some of this is like who do they room with? Like there are also, there are just a bunch of things that come up that schools and administrators need to be prepared for um, to have policies in place and to be able to have conversations with families um, to be able to figure out. The thing is, is that it is important to have kind of general sweeping pieces like, you know, different kinds of bathrooms helpful. Um, not telling a kid what kind of bathroom they have to use, also very helpful. Um, but, you know, the other piece is also having some flexibility in talking with families because sometimes kids aren't out yet in certain spaces or in certain ways. So some of this is just also having some room for flexibility around talking to families about what they need. Molly, well, did you have any final insights about things that schools might be able to do? Um, again, I feel like I could <laughs> talk for weeks and weeks and weeks about this. But, um, you know, again, coming, going back to that, thinking about the different systems, um, you know, a lot of times we talk about incremental change in the research community. And so thinking about the, the influence of, you know, again, ad, advocating for more policy protections, it's a floor. It's not what we're reaching for, but we don't even have that here in Wisconsin. And um, so thinking about more policy protections at the state level and at the local district level, thinking about ways that we can educate educational leaders um, and educators. Um, a lot of times school staff doesn't get education. And so some of the people who are interacting with kids the most, they're athletic coaches and, um, security and all of these other people who work in schools um, who can have really a really significant impact on kids, um, making sure that they're included in some of those conversations, making sure that this professional development is sustained and that we're making changes across a lot of different systems. So changing classroom practices, but also procedures and um, you know, again, those overarching policies um, and about 30 other things, but um, you know, these, each one of them works better if they're aligned um, with some of these other kinds of reforms. And so we can always do better. There's always um, additional things that we can kind of add on, but it helps to start with a baseline of policy protections, kind of foundational language so that everybody's on the same page and understands what those um, policy protections mean. Um, and yeah, I'll stop there. Uh, we do have a report on Madison, some work we did in Madison that's coming out on the Madison Education um, Partnership page tomorrow. So I will also 
um, you know, uh, if you want to learn more about what's going on locally, you could check that out tomorrow. Um, but I'm also happy to respond to emails if, if people have specific questions about schools. We'll be on the lookout for that. Um, and want to say thanks to both our audience for such great questions and to our panelists for these thoughtful replies. And at this point, um, I want to pose a final question to our panelists and we'll go again in the um, order that we started. And that is, if you can name one insight gained from the work or experience of other panelists that you'll take with you today, and what would it be? And we'll start again with you, Dr. Budge. I don't know how I can just say one thing. My co-panelists are amazing. Um, I think I'll, I'll reiterate uh, what Sergio said, which is listen to trans people. That's gonna be the main takeaway that I want people to, to take. And it's, it's, it's always a helpful um, reminder in centering trans people and trans voices um, in this process. And Sergio, if you were going to name an insight that you came from the work experience of the other panelists, what would that be? Yeah, I think for me, something that I'm taking away from what both Stephanie and, um, or I guess undercurrents of like what Stephanie and Molly um, named, um, and this maybe is like a takeaway, like specifically for like trans folks, um, no guilt, no shame and like calling up our like cis like straight allies and being like hey i need this thing because there are a lot of people like who want to be helpful and want to support us um want to like elevate our voices i think that we should also like approach that and like be um have the capacity um and build up the capacity to receive um that walking beside that so much that people are so ardently wanting to, to do with us. Well said. And you, Dr. Molly T. McQuillan, um, <laughs> if you were to list an insight you gained from the work experience of other panelists, what would it be? Yeah, I mean, um, again, this is really hard with this panel. Um, I feel like every three minutes, we got a, a gem dropped here. So um, um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can even pinpoint one thing because my mind is still buzzing um, with the conversation. Um, but I wanna thank the other two panelists for the great work that they're doing and continue to do. And um, you know what? I know that Sergio is doing great things and I, I cite Dr. Budge all the time. And so um, I just wanna express some gratitude for being in conversation with these amazing scholars. So I want to thank you all. Um, I wanna thank our audience. And um, we asked you about these things that you gained from it. And, and I've got so many things on my list, but that's not my job today. And I don't wanna take your real fire. So at this point, we're going to transition to Yurel Lashley to, to help close us with some closing thoughts. All right, thanks so much, Dr. Matthews. First, we wanna thank our panelists as well as audience members for bringing focus, energy, and openness to trans mental health and, and physical health. As the title reflects, binary conceptions of gender are deeply rooted and have negatively impacted trans mental and physical health for a long time. Dr. Budge, we want to thank you for reminding us that gender definitions have always been culturally defined and more generally orienting us to the importance of terms, some of their meanings, and some of the ways these ideas interact with conceptions and assumptions of what we think normality is. Thanks also for sharing that historically trans people have suffered from healthcare discrimination and that care for you is counseling, advocacy, research, and education, and explaining how the centrality of whiteness has impacted trans people of color in ways, including the reality that most therapists aren't trained and that trans 
realities or a trans therapy is thought of as a specialty that people need to be that need to be specialists to be able to provide and that lacking therapists who share some of the experienced identities is an issue for folks and finally that is often not the kids that need help but the parents and that we parents should not be afraid to seek out support from a loving place. Dr. McQuillan, thank you for helping us think about trans care across contexts and relationships nested within other contexts like the US educational system and the country even to a larger extent. And that Wisconsin lacks protections that may exist federally, but aren't able to help folks right here and thus result in health disparities. And that even re recently, two thirds of 18 bills recently passed explicitly target trans youth. That right here in Madison, in our metropolitan, Madison Metropolitan School District, there are disproportionate levels of trans students who have high anxiety, suffer from sui suicidal ideation, which means thinking about suicide, and depression. And thanks for sharing that more training is needed in healthy practices like using pronouns, and that students that students identify for themselves and that those practices have already exhibited positive impact that is in fact supported by research. Thanks for naming systems of oppression and helping us to remember that we what we teach our children creates the social societal realities that we have and that we should try to parent with openness and use parent support groups to find community and just to learn. Sergio Dominguez Jr., thank you for sharing the rich fearlessness of your identity and, the, and your generosity in sharing and being a first generation documented American, queer, trans, middle-class, non-visibly differently abled person from Mexico and the South Side of Chicago where I'm from with no filter to courageously honor yourself authentically. That's an amazing thing to model here for us. Thank you for sharing that if we just frame trans issues and realities along gender lines, we will fall short of having a full enough understanding of progress in supporting care holistically, and that we miss out understanding the intersectionality of how realities play out and are connected. Thanks for sharing on the impact of abuse and naming inner partner abuse and the lack of available help that folks have because it's not safe to seek it out and that interventions aren't designed for trans people. And we appreciate your advice that in supporting those realities, radical healing is necessary, that that includes critical consciousness, radical hope, strength and resistance, cultural authenticity, self-knowledge, self-knowledge and finally collectivism. And that for helping us, and we thank you also for helping us understand that pleasure is also about meeting basic necessities before pleasure is even attainable. I'll say that one again. That pleasure is about meeting basic needs and necessities before pleasure is even attainable. Thanks for calling out the importance of extending voice to more trans people of color and for you personally being willing to be a bridge to connect more people and communities. And thanks for bringing so much love and kindness and showing that it's okay for us to make mistakes, that we all will make mistakes and that we can build together and that we really need to focus on building gender inclusivity in all the ways. And finally, thanks for just saying it's important to just listen to trans people. Thanks to all our guests for helping us see that when considering health for trans people of color, it is important to recognize that many people may have to contend with gender norms of a white dominant society as well as norms within their cultural, ethnic, religious, and class backgrounds. In addition, trans people of color may even be more marginalized or have even greater barriers to accessing health care, including mental health, resources, and support. Or they may come from deeply supportive families, communities, and or, and or cultures that embrace gender diversity but yet still be trying to navigate a dominant social environment that is in fact less tolerant and less accepting. 
And in a time when state legislatures around the country are attempting to ban gender affirming health care for young people, some youth, families, and communities of color, they may have less means to find support or support for their children or give support to their children. In all the sharing strategies, recommendations, critiques, and opinions shared today, the powerfully consistent thread has been making now the time when advocacy, legislation, and healthcare are pathways to agency, safety, health, and wholeness. This is the wholeness that we all need to lead fulfilling lives where we have healthy awareness of ourselves that help build positive connections to others that allow us to make positive contributions to our communities and give us power over our own lives, the very essence of social emotional health. This has been a discussion about policy and advocacy, but also can be a deeper personally reflective endeavor where we choose to celebrate our own humanity by more fully supporting the people around us. For those of us who are cisgender, choosing to bring loving kindness to trans care and more importantly, trans people means challenging our own gender identities, especially given the reality that assumptions about what gender means and has meant are often aspects of our own identities that many of us have not questioned deeply or sought to fully define for ourselves. I'll share briefly that in my own work, through the youth empowerment program I run, trying to support and nurture trans and LGP, LGBTQ youth has pushed me to think about my own identity as a man, how I defined it, and how much I accepted externally imposed norms and expectations. I have two children of my own and the lessons I've taken from helping all youth to become the most genuine versions of themselves has made me a better father to them. The lessons have informed how I've left space for them to explore who they are and express who they are without assumptions, expectations, and pressure from me, and lots of mistakes along the way, I'll add. I don't pretend to understand what it is to feel like, what it, what it is or feels like to be trans. My point in sharing my own journey is just to reinforce, as our panelists have, that all our journeys are connected and that, the, that honoring and respecting the sovereignty of each of our lives and identities can be a powerful collective force. Leading with love and kindness rather than fear and unwillingness to grow requires us to do and be better and also builds trust, safety, understanding, collaboration, community, and a deep sense of allyship. We all have roles to play. Our hope is that this discussion has helped shed light on some ways forward for each of us to support trans health, starting with just listening to trans people, which means centering trans voices as safely as possible and allowing the needs that bubble up to direct real action, real change. Once again, thank you, Stephanie Budge, Sergio Dominguez Jr. and Molly McQuillan for the love and care you brought and thank all of you, our attendees for attending our discussion today. Please remember to take a few moments to fill out the survey in the chat. Good night, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Real Talk for Real Change gathering.